Training load monitoring and prescription has been a hot topic recently within both academic and applied circles within sports science. And really, there's been a lot of arguments and discussions around what are the advantages, what are the limitations, how do we move forwards as a field? And I think a lot of it comes down to different people coming at the same problem, but from completely different perspectives. So hopefully it's really useful to get an academic and a practitioner together to discuss this and think, yeah, how do we move forward? What are the limitations of our own current approaches? And that's the idea of this chat today, really. So as a bit of an introduction, I'm Stuart McCurlane Naylor. I'm a lecturer in sport and exercise biomechanics at Loughborough University. My PhD was very theoretical in nature, looking at the simulation of shockwave transmission through the body after people land on the ground. So purely theoretical biomechanics. I then took a job at a very small new university with a much more applied focus where I got involved in a bit more wearable tech and training load monitoring. Having now returned to Loughborough, I'm trying to merge these two worlds and say, how can we use wearable technology as an input in place of some of the lab or computer-based things that I've done previously to try and advance the training load monitoring field, whether that's in sport or rehabilitation. So that's the background I'm coming from. And I'm really glad to be joined today by Joe Club. And yeah, I'll probably let Jo introduce herself rather than me butchering it. So over to you, Jo. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah, so I'm Jo Club. I'm representing in this conversation the applied practitioner. I have been an applied sports scientist in professional team sports for a number of years. I worked for Chelsea and Brighton in English football before moving to the US, where I worked for the Buffalo Sabres in the NHL and then the Buffalo Bills in the NFL. And now I'm working as a sports science consultant with teams individuals, organisations, sports tech startups all over the world. And I also just love to discuss sports science insights and that translation from the research to apply practice. And I do that through my company, Global Performance Insights, on my blog and my YouTube channel. So I'm really keen for interested to get into this conversation today. So when I was doing some reading since we've been having these kinds of conversations, one of the things I realised was, and I, I probably did it earlier when I was talking about internal and external load. And I know in the in a video I've done, which we'll link to, where I explain the difference between internal and external load. My bias as an applied practitioner is internal load is this physiological aspect that we measure through heart rate or subjective response. But I've recently come to learn a bit more about actually there's these separate pathways around the biomechanical internal load as well, which actually is probably what's driving the physiological response. But then you mentioned before when I was talking about perhaps some of the the tissue stresses and strains that those kinds of things is something that biomechanics research has not yet been able to do. So I just wondered, like, why is that? Perhaps you can explain for more of the sports science and applied practitioner perspective audience what challenges you face as academics and researchers in that area yeah thanks for that it's a really important question i think just to double back on your point about biomechanical and physiological for anyone like the example might not be 100 percent correct but the simple example i often use is you could imagine a cycling workout and a running workout stressing the heart and lungs in the same way so applying the same physiological load However, they would both be using different muscles in order to do that. They'd be placing different loads on specific joints. And that's where you're kind of achieving the same or similar physiological stimulus with different biomechanical stimuli. So when you're then looking for that sweet region of just the right amount of stimulus where you're not overstimulating something and leading towards injury or overuse, and you're not understimulating leading to disuse, it's kind of, well, how can we achieve you know, maybe one session achieve that same physiological load, but in a way that provides more or less of a biomechanical stimulus than the last session so that you can kind of over or under like one system relative to the other. Mm -hmm. I guess even within that physiological or biomechanical would have many different components as we've alluded to. Is it, you know, especially if someone's at an injury risk or going through rehabilitation, do you want to provide the same physiological load, but while underloading specific aspects of that biomechanical system? But to kind of come back to your actual question around why can't we currently do it, really the main answer is it's not necessarily impossible, but it's almost impossible within a sporting context to measure what's happening inside the body in a non-invasive way. 
which then leads to the need for prediction or estimation. And that's where that's where I get really interested, but that's where the challenge lies. Hopefully, it's easy for people to imagine that you can't necessarily have sensors embedded within the body or needles going into the body during a football match, for example. So therefore, if you want to know the load through a tendon or the contact forces between bones at a joint, we're going to have to predict that or mechanically kind of measure some external things linking back to external load, but measure or calculate what would that lead to at a joint level rather than measured at the ground or overall movement of the body. There are different ways in which we can try and do it. I mean, and a lot of it is lab-based or computer-based, which again brings its own challenge of ecological validity, or even if we can do it in a lab, how well does that match what people actually do in the real world? But one way in which we would do it is computer simulation, which maybe sounds more complicated than it is, but it's really a computer model of the body, which could be the whole body and really complicated, or it could be something as simple as really a stick man, where you've got you know, two rigid segments of that's the thigh, that's the shin. If we apply a force at the bottom, how much of it gets to the knee or the hip and very different things. But the inputs that we would need to do these kind of calculations in a lab or computer-based setting would be accurate. The holy grail for us of three things is if we can know the positioning or movement of the body, we can know the external forces applied to the body and we know the muscle activity, we can then calculate or estimate pretty much most of the other things. Ideally, we'd also have some measures on the person. So it could be as simple as height and body mass. And then using studies from the literature, if I know your height and body mass, I can scale certain muscle or tendon values from studies and guess, well, someone with your height and mass would typically have this value. So I'm going to assume that represents you. Like you said, with DEXA or skin folds earlier on, the same thing applies where in an ideal world, you'd get DEXA or MRI scans leading to specific measurements on someone's muscle or tendon so you can be really precise. But then that's not realistic on your precision practicality trade-off. It might be, well, can we take scans once in pre-season and then use those values throughout the year in order to be inputs to whatever calculations we're doing? Or if we can't take scans because we don't have the money and facilities available, can we scale it from height and mass? Do we need all the values? Can we use things like one rep max testing in strength and conditioning in combination with other things to scale some muscle parameters? Or if physios or strength and conditioning coaches are using dynamometer-based tests for things like hamstring quadriceps ratios, can we take peak torques from those tests that are already being done in order to scale some of our models? That all makes it a lot more doable. But even then, in the field, we can use cameras or inertial measurement units, which you have within a GPS unit or some things like a player maker or like IMU step. There are different solutions at the ang- around the ankle. Yeah. Uh, you can use those as inputs to what is the positioning of the body. If we want external forces, which to us typically means ground reaction force, mm-hmm. we don't have force plates all over a football pitch, yeah. but we can maybe estimate something from an insole or from an accelerometer near the ankle. But even then, you know, what's the muscle activity? We don't have EMG all over the person so these are kind of the challenges and i appreciate again that i'm coming with the academic bias and overcomplicating everything but that's what we would need in order to get a gold standard estimate of what was the load through that person's acl during that 90 minute football match in order to try and even calculate it in near real time we would need what are the positionings of their body segments what are the forces being applied at the ground how active were the muscles and how much force were they producing so hopefully you can kind of appreciate that how much of a stretch it is to think we can actually do that Mm. in real time however there have been recent advancements so one that i really like within biomechanics there's a system called open sim which is from stanford university in the states it's an open source computer simulation tool Historically, it's been used by biomechanists in research studies, but OpenSim have brought out something called OpenCap, basically CAP, short for capture, where they're using two mobile phone images. So you basically put two mobile phones, ideally on tripods, so you've got a stationary image. And then from there, within their app or kind of their website, it uses that to scale a model to the person and predict kind of using some AI from two different images, we can predict in 3D where all the parts of the person was. We can estimate from their height, mass, or some simple measurements. 
how long is each part of the body? What might different muscular tendon parameters be? And it can then start to predict some of this kind of loading on the body during really at the moment, it's probably discrete rehab based exercises where you're stood, you are in front of a camera in a small capture volume. Mm. That's where I start to again, get a bit more excited with my line of future research thinking, if we can do this with these open source tools from two cameras with a bit more prediction, we can probably go from one camera to estimating what the 3D positions might be. And then if someone can use one mobile phone to get an estimate, is that accurate enough for what the practitioner needs? Maybe it is, in which case, great. But we're then limited by being in front of a mobile phone. And that's not 22 players running around a football pitch. That's one person in a SNC or rehab setting in front of a camera. So therefore, do we need IMUs as an input instead of a camera? And we already know within biomechanics, there are things like XSense is one company. There are like, there are multiple companies now that have IMU-based kind of suits that, that someone can wear, and it records their movement to slightly less accuracy than a lab-based motion capture system, but maybe good enough for practitioners. And if everybody were wearing that, you can maybe use that as an input to estimate load. Mm. However, again, you're not going to have 22 players on a football pitch wearing a full-body IMU suit. Yeah. So where, you know, can you you one IMU within the GPS unit on the back, one within the or in or around the boots somewhere, or a pressure insole? Can mm. you get two or three sensors somewhere? And then if you're talking about the ankle or tibia, it's probably realistically doable from the inputs we can get. If you're talking about higher up the chain, you might have to estimate, you know, how is the rest of the body moving? And it might be doable. You know, if you can extract from a whole game every time someone jumped you might be able then to predict within the constraints of you know they're doing a jump if i can measure the trunk and the foot or the trunk and the shin can i predict what the kind of dots in between must have been in order to connect that up and there are various ways that we can look to do that but where i think there is scope is going back to my previous example of the ankle or shin if we've got something like a pressure-based insole or an accelerometer at the ankle where we can try and predict the forces being applied between foot and ground. And we've also got something in or around the shin that tells us what angle it's at. It's realistic, and people have done this recently, to estimate what joint moments might be at the ankle. So okay. to say ankle plantar flexion joint moment as one example. And if you know what's happening at the ankle at that kind of overall level, the ankle's quite nice from that perspective in that all of our plantar flexor muscles in the calf go through the Achilles. So whether we're talking about gastrocnemius or soleus, if it all goes through the Achilles, you can then get from what's happening at the ankle to what's going through that tendon, because all of the muscles causing it are going through the same tendon. It's a bit harder elsewhere in the body where you've got lots of different muscles and tendon all inserting at different places. But again, it's maybe overcomplicating it from what a practitioner would want, which is just tell me the stimulus being applied to that tissue i think what i'm trying to get across is that we're nearly there i think it's if you say there's this gap where i started off in my own research between practitioners and training load monitoring wearable technology and then having these big computer simulation models of a movement and this big gap in between you've got people starting at the computer simulation end and trying to work backwards saying can we use mobile phone videos or wearable lightweight sensors as an input to these models You've then got people starting at the other end saying, we currently have a GPS unit and maybe something near the ground. Mm -hmm. Can we predict a bit more from these than what we're currently doing? And I think hopefully we're quite close to meeting in the middle, mm -hmm. but it does need different people working together. So even within kind of grant applications or a team of PhD students and research associates I'm trying to build at the moment, I'm very aware that you're not going to recruit somebody with all of the necessary skills to be able to do it. You probably need a theoretical biomechanist, someone who is a practitioner, somebody maybe even from a computer science or machine learning background that can say, I can, I can try and cross that gap of a bit of prediction. And then those three people together can probably get there. We're not there yet, but I think if we acknowledge we can't actually measure it, so we're going to have to predict it, mm. but what can we actually get away with measuring in the yes. field? And then what would we want to predict? But again, even around that you've then got if we can predict it how does that relate to injury risk mm -hmm. the simplest way would just be measure something for a 
on players for a whole season and see who does and doesn't get injured. But even outside of that, you can maybe take various markers of if you're wanting to get more, you know, two people could experience the same load, one would get injured and one wouldn't. Yeah. Or two people could have the same injury risk. But even it's not this simple. But if you said you've got a 50 percent chance of getting injured in the next month and if we actually knew that that still may or may not actually happen so if you want to actually measure that kind of risk or damage there might be scope to you know what what is there that we can measure in the blood for example as a result of the breakdown or damage in muscle or tendon or bone are there these kind of a bit like we'd take blood lactates from a research perspective can we take any measures at the end of a session or following a session during recovery that tell us some kind of biomarker of how much breakdown or subsequent remodeling of bone or muscle or whatever it is, is happening. And then can we predict that? So can we link that with how much load there was in the session beforehand and say, what's the relationship between load and the resulting damage, which then takes us along that causal pathway or framework we spoke about earlier, where it's not just a black box, but we're saying, we think this metric relates to this load or kind of, we think that this load on the body relates to this metric we're measuring which then relates to this kind of dance or adaptation which then relates to this outcome that we're interested in and if we're clear about that we can actually test each of those things and see whether we're right or wrong whereas at the moment a lot of research combines all of that into one big arrow and it's hard to say whether something is or isn't valid if you don't know what it is so you yeah. know what is what is play load or what yeah. is dynamic stress load you can't say that it's valid or invalid if you can't measure there's no such thing as player load that you can measure in a lab to yeah. compare against player load in the field and say whether you've got the correct value so you need to be specific about what do you want it to relate to and does it relate to that if it does what's the error and is that acceptable if we can estimate it within five percent then okay as long as practitioners know anything less than five percent could just be trial to trial and day-to-day variation I think it's fascinating listening to you about what is coming, where biomechanics research is at, and perhaps we're closer than we think. I always come back to what does it mean for the practitioner and what is the practitioner going to do with it? And I think I we are hopefully now with the improvements in technology, we are going to see this, maybe the precision practicality trade-off ultimately will be overturned if you like because hopefully we'll get to a point where the technology enables us to do both be precise and practical i do some work with output sports which is a irish sports tech startup which are the lightweight accelerometry based uh, devices and and you know they can do so much measure so much again still on that global segment or body level but mu- on a much more practical basis and like some of the tech you were describing in terms of you know, just the not even advanced camera systems, but iPhones and mobile phone camera technology now. And yeah, I recently saw uh, some technology based off of cameras that was trying to estimate ground reaction force and ultimately replace force plates. And so we definitely are moving in this evolution of technology to hopefully answer some of these questions. I guess that then opens a potential can of worms, which may be a whole nother discussion. But it's like, even if you can measure it, what are you going to do about it? Should you change it? And particularly, you know, with the kinematics field and then start to look at people's, whether it's running technique or jumping and their joint angles and and these kinds of measures, particularly if we get to a point where we have it in situ rather than there's a lot of apprehension, I would say, from applied practitioners with, you know, some of the movement analysis that's in that lab-based setting or off the field setting. But then of course, sport, physiology, biomechanics is all very individualized. So do you then actually want to change how someone runs, which I guess comes back to that understanding the causality of loading and load adaptation and injury. But yeah, that's probably a whole another yeah yeah definitely i'm going to sidestep the (laughs) you want to change how someone runs but yeah i think it's a really important question of acknowledging individual constraints especially from a skill acquisition perspective why do people why do certain movement patterns emerge why do people move that way do you want to change it and even understanding if you do change something what are the knock-on effects in terms of Uh how that's going to stress different tissues differently 
and is the yeah. body prepared for that? But just to go back to the really important point you made around, even if we can measure these things, what do we want to do with it? Mm. That's a really key question. I always imagine any presentation or thing we're doing is, can you answer that so what question? Yes. And in reality, yeah, there's work within biomechanics recently that we can, from a single, say, mobile phone video, if it's good enough quality, with AI approaches, people within specific movements, people can predict ground reaction force from a video. People can predict joint moment from a video within things like landing or cutting tasks that have injury screening or rehabilitation applications. But I think, yeah, it comes down to if someone were to give me knee joint, knee flexion extension moment throughout an entire 90 minute football match, what am I going to do with that? And the honest answer is I don't know, which is why I think, yeah, it then comes back again to what do we actually want and why? And it probably isn't every part of the body for an entire training session or match within rehab, I think, or SNC from a kind of gym based exercise perspective. I can see a lot more potential benefit to having tissue specific things, mm. but within overall match or training based, yeah, it comes down to what you're actually going to do with it. Why do you want that information? Are you looking at just want to analyze someone's sprinting or jumping technique within training, or even we want to extract every time they did a max effort. If you've got your GPS unit, you and it tells you how many max sprints they did during a session, do you want to extract each of those max sprints and just run a technique analysis on it? Or look at if somebody's returning from injury, or even not, if you want, if you can get an injury risk, do you want to extract what was their injury risk during each of those sprints that they did in a match context? Within Loughborough, there's a lot of cricket-based research, and mm-hmm. people that I know quite well have done a lot of research with England cricket, looking at fast bowlers that do and don't get lumbar bone stress injuries and kind of coming up with different shapes of what do people who do and don't go on to get these injuries look like at certain phases of a bowling action. But in the lab, I think that potential of can we play a match or do a training session and then afterwards, or even in near real time, extract from that match-based data which of these movements does the player look like as they got more fatigued or as certain match contexts of different batters, different pressure, scoreline pressures changed. Did their technique in relation to some performance or injury risk model vary? I think that could be useful, but I think it does, again, that kind of refers back to that framework of this links to this, which links to this. Unless you do have that, you know, running like this, good, like this, bad. Or with this person, we've been working in training on changing the way they do X. Can we extract that information during a match or training session in their actual habitual training environment? I think that's where a lot more of the potential is than just giving an overall list of hundreds of metrics. Yeah. Do with this what you want. The so what is is crucial. I mean, one example that comes to mind for me is some of the research that's been done on hamstring, on the activation, and it's EMG based, which we know has its limitations, but how the activation of the hamstring muscles changes in sprinting, you know, there is a difference at 85% to 95%. And so as a sports scientist, I'm an applied sports scientist, I look at that and think, okay, so to prepare the body for that load, for that strain, for those demands, that's something I need to expose, ideally expose them to in the training environment consistently. So that to me translates to, can I track and try to ensure that all the players are once, and this is where it's not a pure science, but once a week, once every 10 days are running very fast over 90%, over 95%. And I I think that's perhaps an example of the translation. I guess my overarching as an applied practitioner to the academic is is either keeping in mind or communicating with an applied practitioner about the so what, what is going to be the application, the intervention of it. And, And what then would be, so if that's my overarching message, what would be yours to us, the practitioner, from an academic perspective of how you know, we can help uh, and collaborate with. I think just reach out and have these conversations. I think I could keep talking 
review for hours. And I think we might need to do another one of these, even if we don't publish it anywhere, just for <laughs> my own benefit. But I think reaching out and having these conversations around this is based on the example you've just said, if you want to estimate something related to hamstring activity or hamstring length or force during sprinting, and you want to be able to do it in the field, reaching out and saying, how do I do this? Is there anything currently available? Like, and what are the pros and cons there might be? Or even video-based things at the moment where we can mm -hmm. say, if you know knee and hip joint angles, you can estimate an approximate length of hamstring and get some things that might be useful from it. But if you want to do more than that, this is how we can work together to do it. I think it's almost a selfish request when I say reach out and have conversations because it's how I need or want to work from a research perspective. Get in touch with people and try and have these conversations around. Firstly, this is what we currently do. Do you see any big red flags or things that even, say, play a load that would come back to a few times? Like I've had really interesting conversations with some practitioners around just what do you interpret play loads to mean? And sometimes it's, okay, great, for that context, it does do that. Mm. Sometimes it's, it doesn't actually do that, but you might not be aware. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a checking of this is what I currently do, any thoughts, but also a, this is what I'd like to be able to do. Is there anything I can currently do? How accurate is it? How can I help to make that feasible in the future? I guess the last thing for me is just a massive thank you. Wow, no, thank you. I, I guess I echo completely what you said about reaching out as well, reaching out and communicating and collaborating within the space of, you know, sports science. So I love these conversations around, okay, research, apply practice, how do we bring it together? So thank you for the conversation. If anyone does have any ideas or even mm. anything you want to refer us to where you disagree or think, oh, have you seen this thing that actually were closer than you thought? Or here's a really cool application. What do you think? Just kind of either get in touch with either of us or leave a comment like below the video. And I'm sure like, we'll both be really happy to do some reading. Now head over to Stuart's channel, which is at BiomechStu with the link shown here to watch my video discussing load monitoring from an applied practitioner perspective.